Bring them here to go. Hi, your home family. How's everyone doing this fine and glorious October evening? Tonight, we are going to teach you good evening, your home family. Welcome to the October edition of Creator's Night. Sorry, we didn't meet the first week like we normally do, but we were on vacation. Hopefully tonight, um, we can show you the ins and outs of our new Silverback, um, the newest addition to the Your Home family. Um, we're going to show you the um, all about uh, the first car, how to set up the Silverback. It's very similar to the 3018, so those users um, that are used to the 3018 will find some of this repetitive. But we're going to show you some of the uh, some of the features of the Silverback that are not part of the 3018 setup process, and we're going to take you through um, our first car. Um, maybe on the next product we'll do a more advanced project with the Silverback, like a 3D car. But we're going to start with the basics for tonight. Um, I'm going to turn the camera over to Jim, uh, our lead tech, and I'm going to go monitor the Facebook feed. So if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to type, and we'll try to answer them as we go through. Take it away, Jim. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, to start off with, actually, what we want to talk about a little bit is the features of the machine itself for those that aren't as familiar. So what I'm going to do is switch over here to the camera showing the machine for a moment and look at some of the features that come with that machine. So, as you can see here, this particular machine is equipped with the aluminum spoil board, rather than the MDF spoil board that normally comes with the machine. So, that is one thing that's different, that is one of our accessories available right now. As you can see, this is a much more robust machine than the 3018 is as well. We've got all aluminum extrusion, all steel end plates and bracketry. We've got much larger stepper motors on here. Much more powerful spindle. This is a 48 volt spindle running, I believe it's 400 watts. So a lot more capability from that motor as well, as opposed to the small little motor that's on our 3018. All aluminum construction on the Z-axis as well. So you're not gonna see those bearing issues like we've seen on the 3018. Manual knobs on all the steppers, so you can do adjustments as you see fit. All of your cabling is routed through drag chains keeps everything nice and tidy. This particular machine is also equipped with our Pro Dust Boot, which has a brush type mechanism at the bottom of it to help keep your material clean as you're running, and a vacuum hose that is connected to a shop vacuum. Um, <clears throat> the controller itself, I realize is just slightly out of view here. This is a much more powerful controller. We've got dedicated stepper drivers for each of the stepper motors, as well as all the circuitry to keep the motor, the spindle motor running. This controller will also operate a laser. All of our diode lasers can be used on this machine as well. One big feature that people always ask for, right here on the front of that controller, we've got speed control so you can adjust the speed of your spindle quite easily while the unit's in operation another safety feature right here on top of it an emergency stop button if something happens during your car you hit that button it locks in the down position shuts down the whole machine stops everything from running that way you don't have to worry about being damaging anything or being potentially injured by it Another thing that we've added in, a Z probe for setting your height. If you want to use the Z probe, you no longer have to use the little piece of paper underneath your bit to determine where your bit height is. So that can be a huge time saver for you as well. 
But with that, what I'm going to do now is go through what it would take to initially set up your machine in easel. One advantage that we've got now is we have actually partnered with easel and now when you set up a machine in easel you actually have the benefit that you can select a your home machine. This is applicable to both the 3018 and the Silverback. So you can see here I'm on the easel layout screen. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with that. And what we've done is set up a quick little design for you that we're going to run through here. But the first thing I'm going to do is get us set up on our machine. I've gone through all the steps already. I have my drivers installed on this computer. For those that are familiar with the 3018, you can see that I've got a green car button that tells us that the machine is talking to the computer and we're ready to start that setup. So the first thing we need to do is go to our machine menu and we're going to set up a new machine. This may be a little bit different than what you're seeing in the manual. That's because Easel keeps changing things on us as they do updates. But it's still pretty similar, so you should be able to walk through it fairly intuitively. So if we select the Set Up a New Machine option, it's going to let us know that we're leaving our project, but we can come back to that. <clears throat> it's going to ask us to choose our machine type. Because this is not an Inventables machine, it doesn't go our home machine, we still need to select our other third-party machines. <clears throat> and now right here, a lot of this looks familiar, we're used to seeing this sort of thing. But now when you select a manufacturer, you can come right down here and select your home as one of the options. When you select your home as an option, now under your model selection, you can choose from either the 3018 Pro or the Silverback 6060. Obviously, we're going to select the 6060 for this process. And since I do have a dust shoe installed on it, I'll check that box as well. We click on our confirm settings. It still wants to know what our COM port is. Easel is working on that for us, so hopefully they can get that straightened out before too much longer. For those that are used to the 3018, you might notice that there's a little bit of a change here in that we now see your test wiring gives us a better layout and look on what things look like and what directions we expect things to move. So. I'm trying to see if I can switch the camera view over to one that gives me, there we go. Computer doesn't want to play fair with splitting the screen between easel and the camera, so what I'm going to do is select my Y up and Y down options with testing my wiring. Since all of those are working correctly, yes option on all of those, and we continue to move forward. The spindle control, same thing as we had with the 3018, we have automatic control that allows the controller module to turn the spindle off and on. Now, if you purchased the Makita router and you are running that instead of our spindle motor, you would select manual in that situation. If someone wants to see how easy it is to switch from spindle to Makita, I told them we would do that at the end. Okay, we've got a request to see you switching from spindle to Makita. We will cover that. It's quite easy to do. It's, in this case, a grand total of three screws. 
don't even have to take them all the way out, you just loosen them. So, as I mentioned, the automatic spindle control is for the supplied spindle, the manual spindle control for the Makita. So I'm going to save my spindle preference. As is typical with easel, we want to test that spindle. So we're going to tell it to turn the spindle on. It turns the spindle on for a few seconds. You can probably hear that running in the background. Spindle turned on successfully, so I'm going to continue. Now, this machine does have homing switches, something significantly different from the 3018. So in this case, we do want to enable homing. And when we do that, the machine is going to start going through a homing process. I'm going to actually switch over to the camera so you can see that as we start the homing process. So it starts out checking our z-axis. Y and X axes, and it's not doing it rapidly, it's going fairly slow. It doesn't want to go to the point where it slams into the switches or anything like that. So, we'll give this just a moment here to reach its end point and hit the limit switches. You'll find that when it does these limit switches, it will come up, hit the limit switch back off a little bit, and then ease into the limit switch again. That's intentional. That is basically making sure that it doesn't destroy anything in the process. As noted, these limit switches are there to protect the machine. your machine and you hit a limit switch it will stop the machine and you will have to do a reset now in that reset process they have to hit the reset button on the front of the controller which is right here you may also have to hit the unlock function on easels software which is up there where the jog functions are it will give you an unlock option as is standard across the cmc world you may have to go through that process twice we have seen a few instances where even that reset is not necessarily unlocking everything in that case if you briefly unplug the usb cable and then plug it back in that will get you back into normal operation. So, the next thing that Easel asks us is whether or not we have a Z probe. Well, with the silver back, we did include a Z probe. So, we're going to tell it yes, yes, we do. So, what it's asking us to make sure is that we have our Z probe plugged into the machine, which I do. We want to attach the clip to the collet. Now, normally that would mean we take and connect the clip to the bit or to the collet itself. Just for testing purposes, I'm going to just do this right here on the workspace with just the probe hanging there. Let me switch over so you can see what I'm talking about. So we have our puck or our touch plate and we have our clip. This clip would be connected to the bit or to the collet itself and then the touch plate sits on the surface of your workpiece and that is where it will run the bit down until it just touches that and that's where it sets that height at. So it's asking us in each
You can see there on the easel screen, it says back right now. As soon as I make contact with that clip, we see contact is made, and that lets us know that the circuit for the Z probe is working correctly. Because we've worked with easel, we should not have to make any changes to the advanced settings for that Z probe. However, it's always a good idea just to check and make sure. If we click on the advanced settings options right here in the middle of the screen, the one key thing that we need to look at is that touch plate thickness. Now, our touch plate is 20 millimeters, so we tell it 19.99. That way we know we're going to get good contact. And we can go from there. So since I'm not going to make any changes here, we don't have to change anything on that. The probe rate, retract height, and maximum distance, we want to just leave those at the defaults. So, with that, we have now set up our machine and we are ready to make a carb. I'm not going to run their generic test carb. I'm going to go back to the one that we pulled up previously and walk through those steps there. Assuming it actually saved it. Doesn't look like it did. Huh? So in that case, I'm just going to make a brand new project. We'll start over right where we were. Very typical easel setup. We have our workpiece. We have our work area on the left hand side. Since it is coming up on Halloween, I'm going to go ahead and select a basic Halloween design. And let's see, we wanted that jack-o'-lantern. So let's just pick one of those. Keep in mind, I am using the pro version of Easel, so some of the features you see here might be different than what you have available. I believe Easel does still allow a few free days of pro services, but that would have to be confirmed. You can also bring in your own artwork. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in this right here, and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so we can actually see what the heck we're working with. Move it into the middle of my workpiece. And we wanted to add some text in there. I'm going to use just a basic font. Position that right up above here. Make sure I hit the right button instead of closing it. I actually want to modify my text. Let's shrink this down just a touch. We can see over on the right side of our screen that we still have ample Preview for the bit that I have selected, which in this case is an 8 inch bit. A little bit on the large size, but one thing I wanted to point out is the capacity of this machine. It is very, very much, much more powerful than what we were used to, so we can run an 8 inch bit at a pretty aggressive setting. I'm not necessarily going to cut everything really super deep. I don't want to have to bore everybody by watching this thing grind through, you know, 10 millimeters of cutting. So I'm just going to set it to a 2 millimeter depth. And let's go ahead and tell it, so we want to cut outside the shape path. Ooh, I don't like that. 
What do you guys call in the controller for the comparison to the Just got a question about what we're calling the controller or does it have a specific name? It is just the Silverback controller. It's still GRBL based. The, the basic controls have not changed. It's just all of the internal circuitry is much more robust and more powerful to drive these more powerful motors. So, I've modified our design here. You can see the preview on the right hand side. We have our happy little jack-o'-lantern and happy Halloween. Just like any other project in easel, we can tell it what type of wood we are working with. In this case, it was selected as birch plywood. I'm actually working with a pine board, so I'm just going to select a pine board. I've got the basic measurements down. The measurements I have entered here are actually a little smaller than my piece of wood. For the example we're using here, that's really not going to be that big of a deal. I am using an 8 inch bit. I'll get that installed here in just a moment and I'll switch over so you can see where I get that all installed. That's one of our standard 8 inch or 3.175 millimeter flat nose bits. Same thing as part of our essential bit kit. Our cut settings. Anybody that's worked with the 3018 knows that we always tell you never ever ever use the automatic settings it will burn up the machine well the silverbacks got enough power that you can actually go ahead and probably use those automatic settings you may even be able to bump it up a little bit higher so what i'm going to do is actually leave these automatic settings which you can see is running at 1930 millimeters a minute and a depth per pass of just over one and a half millimeters so this should burn fairly quickly through that wood. So I'm not going to change anything on those. We're going to let it run and you can see how this machine works. So Alden said make sure and tell them about the new quarter We are now ready to start our car, but what I'm going to do is move my machine back down where we want to start at so give me just a second here this is not a dead silent machine you can probably hear it moving in the background These particular bits, the question was asked, is this an up cut or down cut? These are up cut bits, so they should be pulling the material up out of the kerf as it cuts. One thing all been asked that we remind everyone of is we have some new bits that will be available soon. They're all quarter inch shank. We've got end mills that are about a six millimeter cut diameter. We've also got some much more robust engraving bits, similar to the engraving bits you're used to seeing with the 3018, but a quarter inch shank instead of just a little eighth inch shank. And given the speed of this machine, you can definitely move a lot faster. So those people that were used to seeing, oh my goodness, this car is going to take three and a half weeks. Well, with this machine, you can hopefully do it just a little bit faster, even if you're using those pinpoint bits. So, about where we want to have our machine right now from a jogging standpoint. So what I'm going to do is switch over. I'm going to get that bit in.
The machine comes with a pair of rings. Call it accordingly. Make sure your bit is secure. Since we're going to start a car, we'll go ahead and use the So for that, as I mentioned, you've got your clip and your touch plate. There seems to be some lag when you switch from the cameras. Okay. Okay. So we connect our clip to the bit or to the collet. The, given the size of the little wire clip, it might be easier just to connect it to the bit itself as opposed to the collet. And then our touch plate goes right underneath the bit. So we go through our car instructions just like we would see normally. So I'll switch back over to easel real quick. And of course, Easel is going to ask us, have we confirmed the measurement of our material? So we confirm our material thickness. Again, I'm not cutting all the way through anything. Once we let this run here, I'm going to actually go through a couple of the settings that have come up with questions regarding how to cut through a piece of material. We verify that the material is clamped down. We know that we're using our bit. Now we have a little bit of a difference here. It's asking us, do we want to use our probe to determine our work zero, or do we want to do it manually using that old piece of paper trick? Well, since we've got the Z probe, we're going to go ahead and use that Z probe. So when I click on the probe option, it wants me to make sure that my Spindle is over the material, which I just did so. Wants me to verify that the clip is attached. It wants me to touch the plate to the bit just to verify that that circuit is still working. So I lift the touch plate to make contact with the bit, and you'll see that that turned green. And that wants me to confirm that the touch plate is in place. We start the probe process. The machine is actually now slowly lowering the bit until it makes contact with that touch plate and then it jumps back up just a few millimeters. We've now set our zero height, our, our workspace height, so we're ready to move forward with the job. You can see here it does tell us to remove the Z probe from, from the work area. So we pull that back out of the way. The instructions in easel specify that you must unplug the leads from the carriage. That pertains to the X car because their Z probe plugs in right next to the spindle motor. Since the silverback is slightly different and has the Z probe connected to the back of the controller, as long as you have your Z probe in a safe location where it won't get caught up in any wires, won't get caught up in a drag chain, and won't make contact with itself, you're, you're safe to move forward. So we're going to... Hmm? Okay. Got a couple questions, so before I go on, let's see what those were. Does the spindle come with the different size collets that you mentioned? The spindle does not come, the question was, does the spindle come with additional collets? It does not come with extra collets. However, it is still a ER11 collet, similar to what the 3018 uses. So the accessory collet set that we have on our website will work with this spindle motor as well. Now, if you purchase the Makita router, the Makita router comes with a quarter inch shank collet. There are eight inch collets available for the Makita. We do not have them available at this time, but that is something we are working on. They are available from other alternative vendors. If you need one of those, shoot us an email and we will be happy to point you in the right direction at this time. 
all the answers to the other question. The other question was, is there going to be an offline controller for this whole thing? Yes. The other question being, is there going to be an offline controller? Something that we're working on. We understand that there is a, a, re, a desire for that. There is a port on the back of the controller for an offline control, and that is something that we are working with a team to get developed. So, so. back to our carving. I'm going to confirm that my Z probe is put away. I've already told it that I'm ha pretty much happy with the location of this. So I'm going to set my X, Y, zero exactly where it is. Now, in this situation, it's telling me to attach my dust shoe. What I'm actually going to do is leave the dust shoe off for this project. Because if I turn on the vacuum cleaner, it makes it ridiculously loud in here. So this is going to make a mess, but that's our problem to clean up, not yours. We would certainly recommend that you run with the dust shoe if you purchased, purchased one. So I'm just going to basically lie to ease a little bit and tell it, yep, I've got a dust shoe installed. We're good to go. Next step is to turn the spindle on. I'm going to turn it on and turn it up a little bit. It's going to confirm for me that the spindle is on. This warning is always here. We don't want to leave the machine unattended. We want to leave that thing under observation. So let me switch over to the camera so you can watch the machine work as we move forward. So I'm going to hit the carve button and let's see how it does. It's lowering down to the workpiece. It knows how far to go based on our Z probe.
went ahead and cut this job short a little bit because what we're seeing is unfortunately the computer that we're running this on trying to run the live stream multiple cameras and the machine it's really really taxing that computer so what I'm actually going to do is after this live stream is over I'm going to rerun this job and I'm going to take a video of it and we'll post that video so you can see in real time how it's working so, as we can see, however, and I'm not sure how well you can see on the camera, we did get a nice deep cut. We got about halfway through the design, and I'm not sure if I can lower this. Let's see if I can lower this camera without causing too much hate and discontent. You can actually see right here, we cut down, as I mentioned, a 1.5 millimeter deep cut on that first pass at a reasonable speed. And then we get my camera put back up where we were. As I mentioned, I'm going to record this thing running without the computer being all bogged down. So stay tuned for that to be posted here in just a little bit. One big issue that we have had questions about is when we're looking at easel, how do we cut something out? So if we were looking at our easel pattern here, and I'm going to get rid of this and make sure you mention uh, about the extra board with the metal foil board. That's the question on the chat. If you want to cut all the way through something, one thing that we highly, highly, highly recommend, even if you have the original MDF spoil board, 
is place another sacrificial board underneath the material that you want to cut out. Because when we tell it to cut all the way through an item, it is going to run the bit deeper than what the material is, and it will drive the bit into the spoil board. If you have the MDF spoil board, it will cut into that MDF. Maybe not the end of the world, but still not something you want to destroy your spoil board if you can at all help it. Since this machine has the aluminum spoil board, we would definitely be using a sacrificial piece because we don't want those bits to gouge into the aluminum and potentially break a bit. The speed settings that are cutting through wood would certainly not work for cutting through aluminum. So, if we wanted to cut this shape out, this is, as I mentioned, a concern that a lot of people have had, is how do we cut things out? How do we work with tabs? So what I've done is I've selected our pumpkin shape here. And I'm going to tell it I want to cut outside the shape path because I want to cut this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my depth slider here and I'm going to run it all the way down to the bottom. And as soon as I do that, you can see our preview on the right hand side shows where everything's going to cut out. This particular design, probably a little bit extreme for what you would normally want to cut out. But as soon as I brought it all the way down to the bottom, you can see where it entered this little window down here that says use tabs. What those tabs are going to do is leave a little bit of material attaching the workpiece together so that as it cuts through, you don't have pieces start to shift, get caught in the bit, and flail them across your living room, garage, workshop, or wherever you happen to be working. That would obviously be a major safety concern. You can adjust how long these tabs are. They defaulted to six millimeters long and two millimeters high. You can change that as you want. You can change the number of the tabs. As you increase the number of tabs, you will see on the design page these little yellow spots indicating where it is calculating to put the tabs. So that would be where those tabs are going to be. If you're not happy with where it automatically places them, you can simply click and drag them into the location you want. It might be a case of you've got a pattern with a lot of angles and it's trying to put those tabs in you know, inside corners and you want it on a flat section. So you can drag those tabs into a different spot. Once you go through those settings, you go through your same carve function, but now it will carve all the way through your material. Again, make sure you have a spoil board in place. You don't want to destroy your, I should say, an additional sacrificial board so that you don't destroy your spoil board. If you're a silverback owner and you've inadvertently gouged up your MDF spoil boards, we do have replacements available. Just let us know and we can get those out to you. Again, we also have the aluminum one if you want a more robust spoil board for those people that have ordered the expansion kit and are wondering about spoil boards for that unfortunately with the one by one meter expansion kit for the silverback an mdf spoil board is not a viable option there is too far of a span and it would allow the mdf to sag in the middle therefore you would not get accurate cutting so at the time, we are telling people that you will have to fabricate your own spoil board. I know our own team member Jeremy is working on a spoil board for his using 1x6 lumber. We do have an aluminum spoil board bed assembly for the 1x1 expansion that is due in in about a month. We're expecting those to arrive in early December so that we can start getting those shipped out. 
for those individuals that have already either pre-ordered them or want them for their machine. So, with that, I think we're pretty much done with easel. Couple, uh, couple questions. Oh, got more questions, so hold on just a second here. Um, it, so, uh, uh, Paul Ritter wants to know how shallow can you make an etching? That's just going to be setting, but... Yeah, and the question was how shallow a cut can we make? Um, basically as shallow as it will let you. You could go down to, I believe, a hundredth of a millimeter. Although you do want to keep in mind that trying to do something that shallow, you want to be careful that your material is perfectly flush. If you have variations in the wood or it has a slight warp to it, if you have a cut that shallow, it may not contact all the way across if it's not level. And then someone else, uh, Deanna, wants to know, um, how do you all, if you just wanted to cut around the outside of your pumpkin and not the inner pieces, how do you do that? All right, the question was if we just wanted to cut around the outside of this. Right now, this is a limitation of easel that it is not allowing me to select just the outer portion of that. We would have to potentially edit this design as an SVG and so basically develop a vector path around the outside of it that would then be able to define the cut just for that path. Easel software does not have that function unfortunately. There are other software packages available for design work. We have partnered with Carveco. Um, Janice, our UK team member, has done a series of blog posts on using Carveco for various projects. For all of our 3018 and 6060 owners, if you wish to have a 90-day free trial of Carveco, there is a link on our website to request that. We can get that posted up again for you here as well after this live stream is done. Carveco is a subscription-based product. We do offer a 12-month subscription package for that as well through our website. There are other programs. Um, we actually use one called vCarve Desktop that is made, made by the Vectric Corporation. They have various levels of licensing available for that as well. All of those offer a lot more in-depth carve capacity as well as 3D carving, which as Angie mentioned, we're probably gonna look at in the near future as another live event to show how that 3D carving works using STL files. So, the other question that was asked. Will the machine work with UGS? Question was asked if this machine will work with UGS. I have not personally tested it with UGS. Universal G-Code Sender, for those that may be wondering what the heck that is. Um, since it is a gerbil controller, I see no reason why it would not. But as noted, we have not tested that as yet. The request was made that we cover the switching to the Makita router from the spindle. So I want to go through that real quick. I just switched the camera over so you can see where everything's at. So I'm going to grab my handy dandy Allen wrenches that came with the machine. First thing we're going to do is remove the dust shoe. For this dust shoe, there is one screw here on the side of it. We loosen that screw. You don't have to remove it all the way. You just need to loosen it. And then that dust shoe will just slide right off the bottom of the machine. Let me go ahead and remove this bit so it's out of our way and we don't get caught up on things. So with that, we can now remove our dust shoe. I'm removing 
the spacer plate that was with it. Dust shoe is now out of the way. Inside the dust shoe, there is this half moon looking retainer. That spacer is what allows it to fit on the spindle motor. When you remove that spacer, the dust shoe is now the correct size for the Makita router. So I'll set these pieces off to the side. There's your two wires, positive and negative. They are labeled on the spindle. So we disconnect them. And you want to make sure that these wires get set up out of the way so that they won't get caught on anything when you're using the Makita router. As an additional safety feature, you can also unplug the connector for that motor on the back side of the controller. On the front of the spindle holder, we've got two Allen screws here. We loosen these up. Just a couple turns here each is all it should take. And now you can just lift the spindle out of the carrier along with its adapter sleeve. This adapter sleeve is what allows it to hold the spindle motor. That is included with the machine. The machine also includes another adapter ring, this one much thinner, and that's what allows us to mount our laser modules in the machine. So you would drop that spindle adapter ring in there and then your laser drops down in there. Yes, we realize it's counterintuitive that you're putting a square laser in a round hole. However, it does work. That is all it takes. You don't need to clamp that down super tight. We're just going enough to hold the laser in a stable position. And that would be allowing your laser to operate with the silver back. This, the laser cable is not included in the drag chain kit. So you would still have to run your wire from the laser to the back of your controller module. There's also a toggle switch on the back of the controller to allow it to run in laser mode. One other thing to be very aware of if you are running your laser on your silver back. First, don't drop your Allen wrench because then you got to stop and pick it back up. However, when running the laser on the silver back, those that are familiar with the, the laser software where your dollar sign 30 value defines the S max. By default, on our smaller machines, that S max value is 1000. With the Silverback controller, that value is 10,000. So you need to make sure that you adjust your software settings accordingly to match that S max value. It is set at 10,000 to allow for the higher speed spindle. Back to our Makita installation. I've now got just my basic spindle holder here. I grab our Makita router motor. The Makita router normally has an assembly on it because it is a plunge style router. When you get that, that piece is removed and you no longer need to use it. I have also installed the eighth inch collet in this Makita router so that I can use our smaller bits with it. As I mentioned previously, it does have a quarter inch collet when it comes out of the box. It comes with its own wrench for tightening the collet. There's a push button on the side of the machine here that locks the shaft to allow you to tighten that down. So to install your Makita router, you simply slide it down into the holder. And tighten down the clamp screws so that it doesn't go anywhere. A 
It's now secure in the holder. You have to route the power cord safely out of the way so it doesn't get caught in anything and plug it into a standard wall outlet. Now, again, with the Makita router installed, you no longer have automatic spindle control. It will have to be done manually. So you can do one of two things. You can go back and edit your machine setup and select manual spindle control. Or as long as you're cognizant of it, you can continue to leave it in automatic spindle control. And when you click that button at the end of your car process to turn on the spindle, that will prompt you to reach over and hit the power switch on the Makita router motor. And then you just confirm that it is on. So I guess it would be a semi-automatic in that you have to read the screen and then reach over and turn it on yourself. So it's automatically manual. It's going to automatically prompt you to manually turn it on. So that's all there is to changing out the spindle assemblies for the Silverback. As I mentioned, once we wrap up here, I'm going to rerun this job and video that and then you can get that posted for everybody. Um, are there any other questions that we need to cover before we wrap up for the evening? Um, so far there, um, you had a laugh at the square peg round hole. Mm -hmm. um, and someone just asked if we're going to put the video up so they can rewatch this. Can I say yes? Alright, last couple questions, uh, basically are we going to get this video posted for watching later on? Yes, we do record all of these, they will be posted later. Um, not sure what time we'll get that up, it might be tomorrow before those get posted, because I realize we got people around the world, but it is 9pm on our end, so. But we will get that posted for you, hopefully this help you identify some of the features of the Silverback, getting it set up and going through that first carve. I'll get that carve video posted up here as well. If you have any questions about the machine, please feel free to either email us at support at or you can give us a call at 833-541-5997. You call that number, you will get Jeremy. Jeremy is a silverback owner himself, so he can certainly help with any questions you may have. With that, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up for the evening. We want to thank everyone for joining us, and we'll see you next month. And you have lots of thanks, very helpful, great class. I want to buy one, and... Alvin says, great teaching, best night so far.